Hi, everybody. I want to say hi to all of you at our different campuses. And for those of you who are joining us online, welcome to part three of our series on living on a margin, a saner, less stressed way to live. It's based on the fact that life is meant to be enjoyed, not merely endured. Now, when we started this series a couple weeks ago, I explained what I meant by the phrase living on a margin. The margin is the space that I create between my load and my limits. It's, it's having some breathing room in your life. It's having some reserves. So you're not running on empty all the time. And you need margin in every area of your life. You need physical margin so you don't wear out uh, physically. You need spiritual margin to defeat temptation and so you'll be able to have reserves to help other people. You need emotional margin for relationships. You need financial margin to avoid the pressure of debt and you need time margin in your schedule so you're not always rushed and in a hurry and worn out. Now, we're gonna look at each of these in this series on living on a margin. Now, you remember those of you who joined us first week, in part one, we looked at making space to slow your pace. And we talked about five or six very practical ways you can do that. In part two, we looked at learning to slow down. And I gave you five important life principles that you must learn. The Bible says, learn this, learn this, learn this. Five principles you must learn if you want less stress in your life. And if you missed either of these first two messages, please go online to saddleback.com and download the notes and watch that video so you'll be caught up with us. Now, today, in part three, we're going to look at starting your day right. How to start it calmly, quietly, not in a rushed hurried attitude. Now, this is so important. You know, how you start your day will actually determine how you feel throughout your day. Study after study after study has shown that what happens in the first 20 minutes of your day actually sets your attitude and your mood for the rest of the day. How you start in the first 20 minutes affects your attitude and mood for the rest of the day. Now, here's the problem. Too often, you have no margin in the morning. <laughs> we sleep until the very last second. Uh, then you wake up to an alarm clock. And so you wake up alarmed. And then as soon as you get up alarmed, the first thing you do is check your phone for all the bad news that happened overnight. And that uh, stresses you out more. Next, you rush to get ready. You rush to eat breakfast. And you rush out the door in order to rush to work during the rush hour. It's no wonder you're stressed the rest of the day. You need to learn how to enter the day calmly and slowly. And today I've asked Pastor Buddy Owens to teach part three of my series and show you how to enter your day slowly and calmly. Now, part of that includes a quiet time with God. They don't call it a quiet time for nothing. A quiet time with God before you leave for work or school or whatever you need to do, take the kids to school, I can't think of a health habit that'll increase your peace of mind more. So to live on a margin means you're gonna need to get up a little bit earlier so you're not so rushed in the morning. And you establish some margin in your morning so you can start each day right. And here to talk to us and teach us about this from God's word is Pastor Buddy Owens. Would you give a warm welcome to Pastor Buddy? Hi, Saddleback. You know, I know of no better way to start my day off calmly and quietly than with a quiet time with God. Because if I start my day in a hurry, I'm gonna spend my day in a hurry. If I start rushed, I'm gonna spend it rushed. But if I start my day with God, I'm gonna spend my day with God. This continual conversation takes place. He's at the front of my mind all day. He's in the back of my mind all day. Starting off with a, a quiet time lets God set the pace. It lets him set the agenda. It puts him in control of my day from the very beginning. But if I start it all off rushing so much in a hurry and I haven't given time for that, well then I'm not gonna be able to spend the day with the Lord, with that knowledge of his presence. It all starts with spending just a few minutes with him in the daytime. Somebody once said, God is your, is your commander in chief, so don't forget your daily briefing. And that's really what a, a quiet time is. It's the check-in that you have with God. Now, the challenge that I have with that in the morning is that I grew up in a household of musicians. 
So for us, the day didn't really even start till nine o'clock, p.m. <laughs> so if you left everything just to my own instincts, I'll stay up till two or three in the morning. Somebody once asked me, are you a morning guy? I said, if you're talking about one in the morning, no problem. You're talking six in the morning, big problem. I'm, I'm, I'm a late night guy. So the only way that I'm gonna be able to spend some time with the Lord before I rush off to work is if I get to bed a little bit earlier so that I can get up a little bit earlier. But what that means then is that I'm probably gonna have to turn off some of the late night television a little bit earlier. I've gotta change some of my priorities. But you know, when you stop and think about it, there's nothing you're gonna hear on late night television that's gonna be any better than what you would hear from God with just a few minutes in the morning in a quiet time. Now I want you to think about this. <clears throat> quiet time is God's idea. Because if God didn't wanna to talk to you, he wouldn't have given you the word of God. He wouldn't have given you the Bible. If God didn't wanna hear from you, he wouldn't invite you to pray. Why would God invite you to be in his presence, to come into his presence, if he didn't want to be in yours? It's his idea. He's highly relational. God has something to say to you every day. And he wants to hear from you every day. So if I'm going to make this room, this margin in my life, to have a quiet time with God, well, what does that actually look like? What is a quiet time supposed to look like? Well, when Pastor Rick asked me to bring this message, I knew he was gonna be out of town. So I invited a friend of mine, one of our pastors here, Anthony Miller. He's our pastor of communications. And I asked Anthony to preach this message with me. Because you know, after all, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but Anthony's got a great perspective on quiet time. So I asked him to bring a part of this message with me today. So you're gonna hear from him in a few minutes. But I want to start by just giving you the first rule, the most important rule. I want you to write this down. The most important rule is you must slow down. Just slow down. I know that sounds obvious, but sometimes the obvious things aren't so obvious. You've got to slow down. You see, God is never in a hurry. When you worship an eternal God, you don't have to be in a hurry either. He's never in a hurry. And you cannot hear God's voice if you're going too fast. You'll miss out on what he wants to say to you. That's why you've got to get up early enough so that you're not in a rush from moment one of your day. Here's what Jesus said about it in, uh, in Matthew chapter 11. He said, are you tired? Anybody here tired? He said, are you tired and worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. Anybody want to recover your life? Does it feel like your life is just going too fast and you're losing everywhere you look? He says, look, just get away with me and you will recover your life. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. If you'll just walk with me and work with me, watch how I do it. Learn, I love this phrase, he says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. So there's an invitation that you don't want to pass up. So here is the first thing that you're going to do if you are going to slow down for a quiet time. You can write this down. You've got to slow down to read God's word. That's where it starts. Slow down to read God's word. You see, God didn't leave it to us to figure out all on our own how to live the life he wants us to live. He left us with his word. He gave us the word of God. He gave us the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit in us to teach us how to live the life that he wants us to live. The, the Bible was inspired by the spirit of God when it was written and it is inspired by the spirit of God in you when it is read. These are words of life. They're words of hope, words of direction, words of comfort, words of strength and in encouragement and you cannot survive without them. Without the word of God, you will wind up heading in the wrong direction. You'll wonder why life doesn't make any sense. You've gotta be a person who is getting into the word every day. It's not enough just to have a Bible in your home. You gotta have the word of God in your heart. The Bible is not a good luck charm. Oh yeah, we've got one in the house. You ever read it? Nope, but we've got one in the house. 
No, it's something that's going to change your life from the inside out. That's why God gave it to us. He took the time to give us his written word because he wants us to take it into us and then to, to respond to what God says to us in his word. Here's what the Bible says about itself in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, all scripture, all of it is inspired by God. And it is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. So if all scripture is inspired by God, then that means that God can meet you in any book, on any page, in any verse of scripture. If you'll just take the time to slow down and read it for a few minutes. I love to talk about how to have a quiet time. Many of you know my story. That for so long, having a quiet time was really an issue of, of frustration and failure for me. Because I wanted to be a man of God. I wanted to be a man who prayed. But I was led to believe that if you really want to be a, a godly person, if I want to be a godly man, then that means that I have to I have to pray for an hour a day and I've got to read through my Bible in a year because that's what a godly man does. And I thought, okay, I'll show them. If anybody else can do it, why can't I do it? I can do this. I can read through my Bible in a year. I'm going to read from the book of Genesis to the book of Maps in 365 days. <laughs> no problem. So I got myself one of those one-year guilt trip Bible reading programs. <laughs> In the King James, of course, because after all, that is the translation that Jesus read. And I'm going to pray for an hour. I'm going to read through my Bible in a year. And I was just setting myself up for failure. Because remember, I'm not a morning guy. And because I'm not a morning guy, I kept falling asleep on the couch trying to pray for an hour. And because I fell asleep on the couch trying to pray for an hour, then I got further and further and further behind in my one-year guilt trip Bible reading program. And it just, now in the beginning I was doing okay, because you know when you start the book, in the first four chapters, it starts off with a nude scene and a murder. Okay, so that's, that's, that's okay. I'm just saying. I didn't write it, I'm just telling you, that's what it is. And then I got eventually to the begats. Many of you know the begats, those long lists of names, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -so begat so-and-so, who was a real so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and, -so, and, -so, and just on and on. You gotta be able to speak in tongues to say some of these names. And I'm reading all these names, and when I got to the begats, the whole thing just, it just fell apart for me. It just, I just, I gave up. I just thought, I, this isn't gonna work. I can't do this, I'm too far behind. I can't do this prayer thing. I can't stay with the program. I don't understand this language. It's just not making sense. And I gave up, I was frustrated. What I wanna share with you today is a method that I taught myself on how to have a quiet time that absolutely changed my life. It changed everything about me and I wanna share it with you. I wanna tell you today what took years to get through my thick bald head and it's this first thing to write down. It's that Bible reading and prayer are not two separate activities. They're two parts of a conversation. They're not two separate activities. They're two parts of a conversation. God talks to you in his word, in the Bible. You talk to him in prayer. Sounds pretty simple. For me, it was an aha moment. It should have been a duh moment, but it was an aha moment where you just find a quiet place you get your Bible, maybe a journal, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever it's going to be, and you just go spend a few minutes with God. Here's what Jesus said about it in Matthew 6. He said, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. So you're not showing off to anybody here. He says, just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. So since the quiet time is a conversation with God, then you should probably let God start the conversation because in case you weren't aware of this, he is God and you are not. 
So it's best to let him start the conversation. Let him start with what's on his mind. Don't just go in and tell him what's on your mind. So don't try to start with an hour of prayer. You'll fall asleep on the couch. Instead, just start with a moment of prayer. A simple moment of prayer that just says, Lord, I'm here for you today. I want to hear from you. Would you speak to me? Open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart just to hear, to see what it is that you want to say to me. And then you just let God start the conversation in the word. Now, you might say, well, I mean, that sounds really nice, but I got a problem because I didn't understand what I was reading and I got lost in my program and I couldn't finish it and this doesn't work for me. So what am I supposed to do with that? Well, I have a couple suggestions. One is find a Bible translation that you can understand. It doesn't have to be in the King James. Jesus didn't read the King James. Sorry, he didn't. Find a translation that works for you. I usually read out of the NIV. But the New Living Translation, the New King James, the ESV, there's all kinds of them out there. They're great translations. Just find one that you can understand. That's pretty simple. And then the second thing, and this is really a very important rule for you to, to write down for yourself here. Instead of speed reading along on your one-year plan, read for depth, not for distance. Read for depth. Not for distance. In other words, don't speed read your way through the scripture on some self-imposed schedule. That is no way to carry on a conversation. We just hurry people along. You just slow down and think deeply about what you're reading. Reading the Bible is not a race. You're not trying to see how you can get through it faster than somebody else. Reading the Bible is not a race. It's an exploration. And so you have to slow down and explore the passage that you happen to be reading in. Even if you are able to read through your Bible in a year, I would encourage you to try reading it this way and see what kind of a difference it might make for you. Here's what the Bible says about reading for depth. Look at this passage in James 1. It says, the man who looks intently, that's slowly is what that means. The man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. That verse is what Bible meditation is about. Biblical meditation is not about emptying your mind. It's about filling your mind with scripture and thinking deeply about what you have read, mulling it over in your mind over and over and over again. Let me give you an example just from the verse we just read. Let's look at it again in James chapter one. In fact, you might want to circle some things in your notes as we go through. If I'm going to just slow down in this verse, I'll read it like this. The man who looks intently, intently, that's slowly, that's gazing deeply at something. He says, he gazes deeply, intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. You need freedom in your life? You're going to find it in the word of God. He says, the person who does that and doesn't just do it once, it says, circle the word continues. He continues to do this over and over, coming back more and more intently. He continues to do it, not forgetting I love this word, what he has heard, circle heard. Notice that it doesn't say not forgetting what he saw. God will speak into your heart. You will hear the voice of God. You'll hear the author himself when you read his words. He says, not forgetting what you have heard, but doing it, applying it. He says, he will be blessed in what he does. That might be as far as I make it one day in my daily quiet time. Just one verse, because it caught my attention, and I'm going to dive into this verse and read for depth and not for distance. I'm going to slow down and ask myself, how does this affect my life? How does this change my perspective and how I see things that are going on around me? You see, you cannot meditate on Scripture quickly. You can't look intently in a hurry. There's a big difference between a deep gaze and a quick glance. He's not talking about a quick glance. That's what reading your way, speed reading your way through scripture, is just a quick glance, but I gotta keep moving. Some people read their Bibles like they're on some kind of a deadline. 
It's like they say to God, okay, Lord, here's the deal today. You've got 10 minutes or three chapters, whichever comes first. So if you're gonna say something to me, you better say it fast because I'm not waiting around. That is no way to carry on a conversation. That's no way to have a relationship with anybody. Try that with your spouse and see where it gets you. Well, why would we do it that way to God? We slow down and enter into the conversation that he is starting. That verse in James says, if you want your life to be blessed, then this is how to read the word. Read it intently and slowly and habitually, continually, over and over again. That's how your life will be blessed. And by the way, here's one of those blessings that comes out of scripture. Did you know that reading the Bible can keep you from sinning? Here's what it says in Psalm 119, 11. He says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's the hiding of the word. It's planting it deep within you. It comes from this kind of slow, ponderous reading that plants it deeply into your soul. And he says, I have planted, I've hidden your word deep in my heart so that I will not sin against you. When you do this, it changes your life because it changes how you think. And when you change the way you think, that's when you begin to change how you behave, how you live your life. So you could show me a Bible that is falling apart and I will show you a life that probably isn't. Now, I've asked Anthony to come, and Anthony is going to bring us the second step in slowing down for a quiet time. So if the first part of slowing down is to slow down to read God's word, then the second part of slowing down is to slow down to hear God's voice. See, these two go hand in hand because the more you understand God's word, the better you begin to hear his voice. So as you begin to approach scripture and read scripture, scripture, talk to God. Ask him, what's in this for me? What is it that you're trying to teach me? What is it that you want me to know right now through this, this scripture? And don't be surprised if he answers you. See, some people think that like hearing God's voice is this once in a lifetime experience or once every once in a while. That's not true. God wants to speak to you every day. Look at this scripture in Isaiah, I love this. In Isaiah 50, he says this, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. God wants to speak to you every day, every day. And if you don't hear him, that either is two things. Either you're not, you don't know his voice or you're too busy for him. Either you don't know what he sounds like or you got your hand up like talk to the hand, I don't really got time for you. Let me, let me say something about busy because busy is so, such a deadly uh, trap. Busy, B-U-S-Y, busy is being under Satan's yoke. Busy drowns out the voice of God. Don't let the busy of your day drown out the voice of your God. See, the enemy wants to use busy so that we are no longer effective and being useful for God's will in our life. That's his number one weapon against us. And margin is the opposite of busy. Margin tells us that we value this space so that we can have quiet time with God. See, Pastor Rick is absolutely right. The way you approach your day, the way you start your day has a profound impact on the rest of how you're the rest of your day is. But let's be a little honest. Some of us aren't really morning people, are we? In fact, some of us aren't really even Christian before eight o'clock. <laughs> I get it. I'm not really a morning person either, so I get it. So some of us gotta be really creative in the way we approach our day. Some of us gotta get a little more creative in finding our quiet time. And maybe it's not a single quiet time in the morning. Maybe it's quiet times all throughout the day. Maybe when you get in your car and you drive to work, you turn off your radio so you spend a little time in silence. Maybe when you get to work, you say, you know, before I do anything else, I'm gonna spend the first 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and spend time in God through prayer or journaling or reading. Maybe you, you take your lunch time and you eat really quick in the first 15 minutes and the rest of the lunch time you spend reading and praying and listening to God. Or maybe at night, instead of binge watching seven episodes, 
You binge watch only six and use that last hour to spend some time with God. Whatever your thing is, the point is value margin so that you're protecting this quiet time with God because the, here's the thing, God wants to speak to you and he wants to speak to you every single day. And he speaks to us in a variety of ways. But before I get into those, I kind of want to set some guardrails because one of the common questions I get as a pastor is, how do you know it's the voice of God? How do you know when God is talking to you versus, you know, like self-talk or versus, you know, hearing from the other guy? How do you distinguish the two? Well, there's two kind of guardrails I want to put in place. First, God's voice will never contradict God's word. It's important that you read this because you need to know what God is saying and what he's not saying. He cannot contradict himself. It's impossible. It's not that he can't. He, he, he just won't. He cannot contradict himself. It's absolutely impossible. So if you're hearing that you should rob a bank, no, nah, that ain't him. Sorry. Thou shalt not steal. That ain't him. If you're hearing, you know, I need to leave my wife and join the circus, no, nah, bro, that ain't, that ain't him. It ain't in here. At least not my version. So God's word can absolutely not contradict himself. Um, the second guardrail that I find helpful in discerning uh, the voice of God versus the enemy is the enemy, uh, when he speaks to you, it feels like a push. When God speaks to you, it feels like a pull. Let me explain what that means. When the enemy speaks to you, he's pressuring you. He is pushing his agenda on you. He's pushing you further and further away from God's will in your life. He's, he's saying, buy this because everybody else has it. Buy this now because the sale's gonna end. You know, cheat on your test because you have to pass. This pressure, he pushes you. That's not God. God gives you free will to choose. But what God will do is he'll pull you. He'll draw you. He will, he will allure you. He will pull you and call himself to him. It's kind of like a dad calling his, his newborn, you know, his little baby that's walking for the first time. He's calling him to come to him. I remember when my, my oldest was beginning to walk and he would kind of pull himself up on whatever he can get his hands on, tables, chairs, whatever. And, you know, he'd be standing there all excited with his big wobbly head. You're like, <laughs> you know, wobbling his head and, 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 and getting all excited, looking at me, you know. And, and, and I'd be like, come on, come on, Titus, come to daddy. Come on, come on. He's all like, <laughs> you know, getting all excited. And then he takes a step and then he's, he's scared because you see the, the, sheer, the, the, the terror on his face. He's like, and then he takes another step. He's like, I think I can do this. I'm like, come on, come on, Titus, come to daddy. You can do this, you can do this. He's like, okay, I can do this, I can do this, right? And then he gets to me and I pick him up and I embrace him. I'm like, you did it. That's what God does to us. He's calling you to him. He's calling the created in you, the, what, the, the person he, call, he created you to be, he's calling that out of you and he's calling you to a place that he's already at, a place that he's already prepared to, for you. He's like, come on, Peter, come on, come to me. Get out the boat, walk on water. Come on, Peter, you can, you can do this, come on. Come on, Moses, come out of Egypt, come on. Come on, get your people, come on, let's go. I got a place prepared for you, come to me, come. Let's go, let's do this. Come on, Deborah. come on, girl. Hey, I need a leader and a prophet for my people. Come on, you're it, let's go, let's do this. Let's do this, come on, Mary. I know you're a little girl. I know you're afraid, but I need a mother and this world needs a savior. Come on, come to me. That's what God is doing, he's calling you out to him. It's a pull, it's not a push. And every time you take a step, you get more courageous and God's voice gets louder and you hear his voice and it's so encouraging. You get more courageous, more courageous. And before you realize it, you're walking on water. That's a good God. That's a good God. So now that we know God's voice, let's look at three common ways how, how he speaks to us. There's several ways that God speaks to us, but I, only, I, I chose this to look at three. First, he speaks to us, you might wanna write this down, he speaks to us in his word, through his word. This is what Buddy was talking about, so we don't have to spend a lot of time here. But as you read scripture, the more time you spend in scripture, you'll start realizing that it's more than just text on pages. It, it's alive, it speaks to you, it encourages you. In fact, I love the scripture in Hebrews 4.12, it says this, the word of God is alive and active. 
It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I love the message translation. It says this. It's like a, a doctor's scalpel, a surgeon's scalpel that cuts us open and lays us open to listen and obey. Sometimes truth hurts. And the, and, the, and, the, and the word speaks to us and it's alive. So that's the first way God speaks to us. The second way God speaks to us is through his creation. God speaks to us through his creation. And if you want to learn about the character of God, probably one of the greatest ways is to actually spend time in, in, in what he created. I promise you, it will speak to you. Maybe, maybe move your quiet time out of your house and maybe go to a local park or a garden or the beach, or maybe go on a hike, or, or, or at night, lay outside and look at the stars, because I guarantee you, his creation will begin to speak to you. The waves will begin to speak of his power. The colors and the patterns will begin to, to express his creativity. The, the birds of the air will begin to declare his love. Creation will speak to you. I love what Romans 1 says, it says, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his internal power, his divine nature has been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. God is speaking to us daily, even through his creation. So find your quiet time and a place in what he created. So the third way God speaks to us, write this down. He speaks to us through his still, small voice. And I think this is my favorite because it really reveals who God is and his relationship to us. It's found in this amazing story in the Old Testament by this amazing leader. His name is Elijah. And Elijah is this, I mean, he's the man. I mean, he made it rain, literally late made it rain. He prayed and rain came down. This brother is cold. And so he is afraid. But at this point in scripture, he is afraid. And he's running for his life. And he goes, hides in this cave. And he desperately needs to hear the voice of God. Desperately. And look what scripture says. It's in 1 King 19. He says this. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. I find this very interesting that God did not decide to show up that day that he desperately needed to hear. He didn't show up in the wind, in this big giant earthquake, and he didn't show up in this big fire show, which would have, all three would have got my attention. I don't know about you, those would have got my attention. But he decided to show up with a small voice. And there's a lot of speculation of why he decided to show up with a small voice, but here's what I think. I think he showed up with a small voice and decided to speak to Elijah in that cave with a still small voice, with a whisper, is because he was close to him. He was so close in that cave to Elijah that all he had to do was whisper. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel really good that our God is so close to us that all he has to do is whisper. And we hear his voice if we wanna listen. This is big news because our God, you know, we have this idea that God is some foreign king from some foreign land that rules us from afar, or he's some judge in the sky, or he's some ancient idea in, found in texts from a long, written a long time ago. But no, that's not true. God is right here with us. In his very name, Emmanuel, God is with us. He's right here right now. And this tells me that he's not afraid to go into your cave. He's not afraid to speak into your fear. He's not afraid to speak into your doubt. He's not afraid to speak into your depression, into your anxiety, into your addictions. He's not afraid of any of that. He's right there and he's so close to you that he has to whisper to talk to you. That's the God we serve. So I, I, I don't know what brought you here today. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what face, your problems you're facing or pain you're feeling, but I do know this. You need to hear God's voice. 
And the only way you're gonna hear God's voice is if you slow down and listen. But he's gonna come up and finish this out. So you slow down to read God's word, you slow down to hear God's voice, and finally you slow down to respond in prayer. Slow down to respond in prayer. Remember, Bible reading and prayer are two parts of a conversation. God started the conversation in his word. You read, you thought, you wrestled with the text, you meditated on it. Now it's your opportunity to speak. He started the conversation, now you begin to talk to him. This is where your thinking and your listening and your meditating on the word really turn into serious prayer. And you begin to say back to God what God was saying to you, only you put it in your own words. It's sort of like when you're having a conversation with somebody, any of those, those of you who are married, I don't want to accuse anybody here of arguing with your spouse. Let's just say when you're having intense fellowship <laughs> and you want to make sure you're hearing each other, so you will say back to them what they said to you, but you put it in your own words. Now, hang on a second. Let me make sure I understand you. And then you say to them what they said to you, but you express it in the way that you want to express it. It's the same way when you have this prayer response with God. He spoke to you out of his word. And you say, now, hang on a second, Lord. You might even be interrupting him. And just say, hang on a minute. I, I think this is what you're saying to me. And you put it in your own words. Say, Lord, is this true? Is this what you want to say to me today? And then you just tell him, here's where I went in scripture. Tell him what you read. Tell him what you saw. Tell him what you're hearing. Tell him what you think. Tell him how you feel about it. You've got to engage your emotions when you come to a quiet time. How can you have a relationship with anybody if you never engage with that person at an emotional level? It would just be a dry intellectual exercise. God gave you your emotions. He's not afraid of them. Engage your emotions. Read the book of Psalms. It's a very emotional prayer book. Jesus was emotional when he prayed. Now some people will say, yeah, but you know, the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. You can't trust it. Yeah, it does say that. But it also says that you are to love the Lord your God with all that deceitfully wicked heart of yours. <laughs> Engage the text at an emotional level. How does it make you feel? Lord, I feel joyful. I feel hopeful. Lord, this makes me feel thankful. This makes me feel sad. This, whatever it is, however it makes you feel, tell him what you're thinking. Tell him how you're feeling. Enter that conversation with him. Let him know. Tell him what you're learning. Tell him what you're still confused about. Tell him what's on your mind. And here's what will happen. You will find that you begin to pray biblically because you're saying, Lord, here's what your word says, and therefore, this is how I'm praying. Lord, you said... And so I'm asking, Lord, you said, and so I'm going to believe this. I'm going to confess this because you are now praying biblically. You're praying, you're agreeing with God in prayer and it will change your whole prayer life. Prayer is not anything fancy. We're not talking about the, the eloquence of public speaking here. We're talking about a personal conversation between you and your best friend. And in those kind of conversations, you don't worry about how you sound. You just want to be honest and open and engaging. You're not trying to impress God. You're just talking to him. God isn't looking for eloquence. He's just looking for honesty. And sometimes your prayer might be a simple prayer that just says thank you. Sometimes it might be a prayer of confession. It might be a prayer asking for strength or for hope or for wisdom, or direction, or for courage. It might be a prayer of intercession, or you, praying, you begin praying for somebody else that came to mind as you were reading that passage. But get this, your prayer doesn't have to be out loud. It doesn't even have to be spoken. God listens even to silent prayer. In fact, look at this verse Psalm 5, I want you to circle three words as I read this verse. 
He says, give ear to my words, O Lord. So circle words. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my sighing. Circle sighing. Some translations call that groaning. He says, listen to my cry, circle cry. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. He's giving three ways of praying. You can pray with your words, you can pray with a groan, a sigh, or you might even be crying. If all you can do is sigh, then sigh. If all you can do that day in response is cry, then cry. If all you can do is groan, then groan. God hears your prayer. It's like a father sitting at the bedside of a sick child listening to him groan. He hears you. He gets you. It doesn't have to be some eloquent, masterful work of poetry when you pray back to God. You just communicate with him and tell him what's on your mind as best you can. Prayer is the language of the heart. It's a heart issue. That's why you engage your feelings when you come to the Lord in prayer. So I want you to write this down. It's so important to know that the ultimate objective in a quiet time, the ultimate objective is not to study about Christ, but to spend time with him. It's not to study about him, it's to spend time with him. Why? Because we become like the people that we spend time with. Anybody who's a parent knows that's true about your kids. We become like the people we spend time with. And the more time you spend with Christ, the more you become like Christ. Now I wanna wrap the message up by, by giving you a simple five-step plan, because some people like plans to help them get started. I wanna give you a simple five-step plan on how to have a daily quiet time. Before I go there, I just wanna say this while I'm thinking of it. If you've never taken class 201, you all know about our class system. Class 201, we teach about how to have a quiet time. We go much more in depth about how to read the Bible and how to pray. And I really want to encourage you, if you haven't taken the class, take the class. If you want to learn how to have this quiet time, take that class. Now, let me just give you this 15 minutes with God, this little pathway you can follow to help you get started. <clears throat> Number one, relax. Relax. Don't feel guilty about all of this. Just relax and take it easy. Slow down and be still. Before you open your Bible, take a moment to open your heart. Just sit in the Lord's presence and just say, Lord, come and speak to me today. The Bible says this, Psalm 46.10. It says, be still and know that I am God. In other words, if you want to know that he's God, you got to be still. And it, be still doesn't mean be quiet. Be still means calm down. Take it easy. No freaking out. Calm down to know that he is God. So that's number one, relax. Number two is read. After you relax, now you begin to read. Four minutes. Just read. Now, if Bible reading is new to you, if you got lost in your one-year Bible reading program, and you're not sure where to start, I would suggest that you start in the book of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. It's my favorite book in the Bible. I would start in Matthew. I want to warn you that if you're going to go there, the first 17 verses of chapter 1 is kind of like reading out of the phone book from the Middle East. Okay? It's another one of those lists of names, right? So-and-so begat so-and-so. It's the genealogy of Jesus. Skip it. Yeah, that's what the pastor said. Skip it, okay? You can come back to it later. This is all new, okay? But starting at about verse 18 of chapter 1, all the way through the rest of the book, the narrative of Jesus' life unfolds in front of you, and it is absolutely magnificent. You read about the, the miracle of his birth. You read about his baptism. You read his, his sermons, his teachings, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his passion. It's all in the book of Matthew, and it is absolutely magnificent. The point I want to make, though, is that regardless of wherever you decide you're going to read in the Bible, start in the beginning of a book. Don't just start in the middle. Start in the beginning of a book and stay in that book until you come to the end. Don't just hop around from place to place. 
Stay in the book until you come to the end, no matter how long it takes. If it takes you a day, a week, a month, it doesn't matter. Remember, it's an exploration. It's not a race. You're reading for depth, not for distance. You're reading conversationally. You're not speed reading. So however long it takes is fine. God is not in a hurry, remember? So just take your time, read through that book, stay in that book until you come to the end of that book. And just read along and then stop whenever something catches your attention. Something makes you go, hmm. Something makes you go, wow. Something makes you go, Lord, help me understand. Stop and dig deeper. Just stay in that place. You may come back to the same place the next day, but that's what you're gonna do. Just stop and reflect. The Bible says this, Psalm 119. I love this verse. It says, open my eyes. It's a great prayer. Open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. So you relax, you read, and then number three, you reflect. Reflect. You're gonna think about what that passage means to you. This is the Bible meditation part I was talking about. How does it apply to your life? What is God saying to you? You might even come to the same place three or four days in a row because sometimes it takes more than two or three conversations before you really get the point. But you're just gonna reflect on it and think about it and ponder on it. Put it in your own words. Lord, this is what I hear you saying. The Bible says that it is a lamp and a mirror for the soul. So you ask, as I stand in the light of this truth, what am I seeing about myself? As I stand in the mirror of this passage, how do I look? What's my reflection like here? So you're gonna reflect and, and meditate on it. Psalm 119, 97 says, oh, how I love your law, I meditate on it all day long. If you start doing it in the morning, you'll find that you keep thinking about it all day. Then number four is you record. After you reflect, now you record. This is where a journal can be really helpful. You're just gonna write out a personal application, some kind of a statement that says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm seeing in the word. This is what I'm thinking about this passage. Writing it down brings clarity to your thinking. It turns the gray into black and white. If you can't write it down and put it into words and you haven't really thought it all the way through yet, so I'd encourage you, write your thoughts down. The other thing about writing is that it gives you a record of how you encountered God in a passage of scripture. It's some, some memory you can take with you so that in the future, when you look back on it, you can remember, man, I really met God that day. And it'll build your faith in the future. The other thing that it'll do is it gives you something to give away to somebody else. God isn't speaking to you just for your own benefit. He intends you to give this truth away to someone else who needs it. In fact, there's an interesting verse in Psalm 102, verse 18. It says, he's talking about the writing of, of, of a history. He says, let this be written for a future generation uh, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. You don't know whose life you might touch through something you wrote down in a journal. It might not happen for 50 years. You don't know what could happen. He says, write it down for maybe for someone who hasn't even been created yet. Now, journaling is not commanded in the Bible, but it is demonstrated throughout Scripture. In fact, that's how we got the book of Psalms. David was journaling. He was writing songs, writing poetry, but first he was reading the first five books of the Bible, and you find him writing out his thoughts and his prayers in the book of Psalms. That's how we got the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk and all of those prophets. They were writing down what God was saying to them. It's a great habit to get into. So after you reflect, now you go to request. Request. This is your prayer time. This is when you get into some serious prayer. You have reflected, you have been recording those thoughts. Now you start writing down your prayers. You finish your time with God by talking to God about what he has shown you. There's another promise, another benefit that comes from doing this. In 1 John 5, 14, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, so he's talking about prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The word of God reveals the will of God. 
And the more you know God's word, the more you know God's will. And the more you know God's will, this passage says, the more you will see answers to prayer because you're praying according to the will of God that has been revealed through the word of God, through scriptures. So slow down to read God's word, slow down to hear God's voice, and slow down to respond in prayer. It's just that simple. Read for depth, not for distance. Engage God on an emotional level. Tell him what you think, what you feel, but always let him start the conversation and don't be in a hurry. And before we close in prayer, I just wanna say one last thing about falling asleep in prayer. I joked about it a while ago and don't look at me like you've never done that before. <laughs> but I just wanna say this, that the next time you fall asleep praying, don't worry about it. No loving father ever got angry with his child for falling asleep in his arms. So let's pray together. Father, your word is magnificent. It is so encouraging, so filled with hope and life and truth. It's such a treasure and a gift that you've given us. And we thank you, Lord, that you didn't mean for it to be complicated. You keep it simple. It's conversation. So Lord, would you help us to be people of the word? Would you help us to be people who will commit ourselves to say, yes, I'm gonna spend the beginning of my day with you. I wanna hear from you today. I'm gonna slow down to read. I'm gonna slow down to listen. I'm gonna slow down to respond. Lord, may our relationship, our friendship with you become deeper and deeper as we spend more and more time in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.